The potter's wheel has existed for much longer than many think. The oldest known depiction of potters using a wheel is 3000 BCE. These ancient wheels were very different than modern ones, not only because of not using electricity. The earliest pottery wheels were simply round tables that could be turned to allow the potter to more easily use coil building techniques to form pots. These simple wheels allowed the potter to access all sides of their work without moving. The, these wheels did not accommodate thrown pottery as we know it, but still sped up the process of making pottery. Pottery at this point was likely still made predominantly in the home for individual use. While making a coiled pot on a rotating round base improved the speed and ease of pottery making, the true innovation in the potter's wheel was the flywheel. This enabled the potter to kick a lower wheel, as sort of shown in the image on the left, sustaining a fast and even speed on the upper wheel. This type of pottery wheel may have developed as early as 3000 BC in China and the Middle East. Um, admittedly, there isn't a lot of information on this, and we only have sort of um, a few depictions and descriptions of these wheels. And this is a print of a potter's workshop. Um, as you can see, the potter's wheel evolved significantly, and that heavy wheel or heavy circle at the base is the flywheel. Um, many of these were made from stone or cement or concrete because they needed to be quite substantially heavy in order to actually do their job. With a fast rotating wheel, potters had an alternative to the fast coiled pot. Pots could be thrown more quickly than they could be coiled, allowing for faster production. Thrown pottery required a very heavy wheel to achieve adequate momentum. Throwing on a momentum wheel as opposed to a powered wheel requires a cyclical rhythm. By the 18th century, mechanically powered wheels became an option improving throwing techniques. That's at point where we were, uh, or the world was in the Industrial Revolution, so electricity um, was becoming more common and being used, especially in manufacturing processes. Shoji Hamada was a Japanese potter. He was a significant influence on studio pottery of the 20th century and a major figure in the Menge folk art movement, which was the return to the essentials of art, which rely on local materials and inspiration flowing from within the potter to their hands. He established the town of Mashiko as a world-renowned pottery center. In 1955, he was designated a living national treasure by Japan. Hamada's influence was felt not only in his native Japan, but also in the West. In the United Kingdom and the U.S., his style and philosophy became well known among studio potters, and he was revered as the archetypal potter. These are several of his tea bowls. Notice the simplicity of form and surface, the natural tones of the glaze. How complex are these? Is he reliant on a complex form to communicate what he wanted, or is he looking back to uh, pottery's history in simple forms that can also relate to production pottery and making quite a few objects at one time? It was said to become a master ceram a master potter um, in traditional training. One had to be able to produce up to 500 pots a day. Um, and that's 500 tea bowls, and that is both throwing and trimming them in one day. So it was a significant task to become a master potter, um, even up through the 1950s. Um, and here is just a link to a video of his. This is also in our sort of class playlist of videos. Bernard Leach was a British studio potter and art teacher. He is regarded as the father of British studio pottery, and he was working at the same time as Shoji Hamada, um, which was they were largely working from about the 19, 
uh, teens, 1920s, up through the 1970s. Leach promoted pottery as a combination of Western and Eastern arts and philosophies. His work focused on traditional Korean, Japanese, and Chinese pottery in combination with traditional techniques from England and Germany, such as slipware, which is using a specifically colored clay um, in a liquid form on top of uh, the clay that one is actually working with, and salt glazeware, which involves um, spraying salt into a very hot kiln as it's near the end of its firing to change uh, how the glaze reacts. He saw pottery as a combination of art, philosophy, design, and craft, even as a greater lifestyle. Leach and Hamada were good friends and heavily influenced each other over their lifetimes of making work. Can you see similarities between their work? Are they both working in simplicity of form and natural colored surfaces in terms of their glaze? Ron Myers is one of the most influential artists and educators living in America today. Based in Georgia, he's helped revitalize the American studio pottery and has brought about new sculptural approaches and has singularly influenced several generations of young artists. Working with red earthenware, Ron's functional pots are made in a very casual and spontaneous manner, reflecting the juiciness of the material as well as the pleasure of the process. His narrative colored slip paintings of rats, fish, bats, rabbits, chickens, etc. all float on the surface in a very gestural, expressionistic style that can be both provocative and confrontational. How do these relate to the works of Bernard Leach and Shoji Hamada? Can you see the sort of natural glaze still reflecting? Are they still very controlled forms, or are they starting to become a lot looser? Do you see any connections between the style of drawing and um, the gestures on the other spots? Um, his works are still related, but they are at a point where they're starting to diverge from the tradition of pottery. Based in Portland, Maine, Ayumi Hori believes that the best handmade pottery encourages connections between people and makes daily life better. Her activism and advocacy promote thoughtful craft practice and support for makers around the world. Most of her works have depictions of animals that tend to be very simple and a bit saccharine. Her color palette is generally muted with only small dots of bright colors. The forms themselves are also very simply shaped to focus on the surface for narration. Um, these tend to be, uh, most of her work tends to be very sweet, sometimes a bit sad, um, but it's always depicting animals and some form of narration. Um, but she's in, involved in a great many um, other projects, especially community projects, in particular the Democratic Cut, which is focused on advocacy, advocacy for participation in the political process by everyone. Kristen Kiefer makes pottery that brings elegance, sophistication, and merriment to the everyday. She has a diverse range of influences and seeks to marry the splendor of past eras with a modern desire for beauty and utility. Uh, what eras do you think that she's looking at for her ornamentation and decoration and the sort of general shapes of her forms? Her influences for these Porcelain vessels range from 18th century silver service pieces to couture clothing and from Art Nouveau illustrations to cake fondant. Such diversity combined with her own personality as a maker culminates in a very unique style. Graceful forms, refined patterns, and lively colors convey a design that is robust as well as elegant and joyful. Sam Chung is a ceramic artist and educator who creates pottery that reframes historical ceramics from a contemporary, cross-cultural perspective. As a second-generation Korean-American, he explores pottery that reframes historical ceramics and explores the metaphorical role of the vessel. In his current work, he references traditional Korean cloud motifs and pottery shapes, 
while juxtaposing past with presence, present through his vivid, graphically painted imagery. His work bridges the fields of art, craft, and design. Some of his works are quite functional, such as this cup on the left. However, this image on the right is actually one of his teapots. How actually functional do you believe this piece is? Um, this is where art design and craft sort of meet in his work because technically you could use this teapot, although it is likely not going to really work very well and it's going to be very difficult to use. Um, so some um, potters do actually work with the idea of functional wares without objects actually being functional. Julia Galloway is interested in pottery that is joyous, beautiful objects with meaning that weave into our daily lives through use. Pottery decorates our living spaces with character and elegance. Teapots celebrate our tea drinking ritual. A pitcher adorns the mantle when not in use. A mug with slight texture inside, the handle allows our fingers to discover uniqueness. Pottery is a reflection and celebration of ourselves. As an artist from Montana, Julia takes inspiration from her surroundings for decorating the surface of her pottery. Floral and cloud motifs are very common. The vessels themselves are generally very simple in shape and are typically altered from how they are formed on the wheel with very simple movements um, just to create a little bit of an unexpected shape. Jason Burnett graduated from Western Kentucky University with a BFA in ceramics, a BA in graphic design, and a BA in printmaking. His investment in these various departments is present in his pots. They are covered in layers of silk screened and slip trailed color, pattern, and imagery to create a harmonious story. He uses pop culture references on traditional ceramic forms, allowing these stories easy access into daily routines. Calamitous tales of his own adolescence are referenced with antique stains, implied cracks, and over-refined patterns. He aspires to create fantastical vessels that celebrate vulnerability and beauty and sugarcoat life's escapades. So he doesn't necessarily let these things be readily apparent, at least at first glance, and he creates images through lots of layering. Doug Peltzman is a studio potter living and working in Chopin, New York. He makes one-of-a-kind, handmade porcelain and earthenware pottery for the kitchen and home. Doug's pieces incorporate a wide variety of influence with, which take the form of highly crafted functional and decorative objects. They have a very industrial feel to the forms themselves. Um, though the glazes vary from being very linear and mechanical to absolutely dripping with color. Um, so there is a lot of variation to his glaze surface. However, a lot of his pots have these very distinctive um, sort of raised lines echoing, um, I'm not going to say gearing, but referencing um, industrial manufacturing pro processes um, while his um, glaze surfaces offer a lot more color and variety. Chandra Debuse's functional pottery incorporates narrative imagery, pattern, and form to amuse and delight the user, imparting a sense of play. In practice and product, her work reflects an approach to make-believe through discovery. She incorporates bouncing lines, candy colors, low relief, and hand-drawn elements into her ceramic serviceware encouraging exploration through use. The determined characters that star in her work dwell within landscapes of leisure. These illustrations employ exaggeration, humor, and metaphor to facilitate the viewer's ability to capture the narrative and apply it to his or her own life. So her forms tend to be relatively simple. However, she does create ridges and hills in the surface um, and often uses those as cues on how to draw on her pieces um, because they create a natural landscape to the form itself. Paul Donnelly is a functional potter that is interested in integrating his work into people's lives because of the close proximity between the user and object. Through use and display, pots will impart meaning that will change with the user's relationship with the work. 
The objects we interact with on a daily basis can conjure experiences in our own lives, often becoming an article of sentiment. How many of you have a favorite cup to drink coffee out of first thing in the morning? He intends to create work where there is a similarity between pieces, but everything is unique in some way. Variability is one of the potter's strengths in terms of designing work. Crafting an eclectic array of dishes is a response to the ubiquity of objects sold through chain stores. How many cups and commercial wares look exactly the same from one store to the next? There might be a little variation, but not much. Matt Long is known for jugs, flasks, whiskey cups, and mugs that reference German saltware and early American pottery. Long throws porcelain forms that are then dipped in thick slip, a liquid form of clay with specific color added, used to produce the soft, rippling surfaces. He fires in a soda atmosphere, so um, I talked about salt glazing earlier. Um, it is also possible to use baking soda to produce a sort of similar effect as salt, so it's put into the kiln or sprayed into the kiln at its highest temperature point to melt onto the surface and it affects the glaze. And thin layers of flashing slips are used to provide subtle color on each piece. Do these feel more like contemporary um, ceramic pieces that we've been showing or are they uh, relate a little more to the older pieces such as leeches or hamadas? Meredith Host creates functional pottery that is simple in form and straightforward in functionality. Do you recognize where the patterns come from? Her decorative patterns are from the embossings found on paper towels, napkins, and toilet paper. Jeff Campana has always found things more interesting once they were taken apart. His fascination with process structure and the way things work has always been a driving force in his artistic pursuits. Um, he's known for wheel thrown pottery that has been dissected and reassembled, yielding decorative lines with structural and psychological implications. Are those simple lines or are they scars? What story do they tell? Deborah Schwarzkopf's processes yield complex forms defined by animated lines and soft planes. Simple wheel thrown and hand built parts are pieced together. She builds porcelain pottery whose defining lines and soft planes are geometric and sensual, elegant and animated, and architectural and organic. She merges nature's placement of hue and the signals employed in human created environments to imply function trigger associations, and call for exploration. Eric van Eymerens makes work that is very industrially designed, but function comes first. He takes inspiration from mass manufacturing and utilizes textures from industrial materials. Um, so even though they are very industrial um, looking, they are very functional. Uh, especially these cups on the left, they're very straightforward, um, but you don't expect to see those very um, industrial textures on something like a cup because as general like, um, this is like metal deck plating. That is not normally something you want anywhere near your mouth. So he tries to sort of uh, juxtapose those interesting textures to his surface so that we interact with them in a different way. Mikey Walsh's work contains divergent qualities, sweetness and sadness, lightness and weight, tangible reminders of life's plain and simple joys, as well as life's bittersweet attendance, impermanence and loss. Uh, these cups are wheel thrown and altered by pushing outward on a cylinder that is fresh off the wheel to form the limbs and features.